What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard in business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're a boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared together. Yeah, and just in case you forgot, you can get scared with us too at RTX. Yeah. Coming up soon. Oh, man. So we're going to have a live show there on July 7th. That's mm-hmm. the Sunday of RTX. Yes. And mm-hmm. that's in Austin, Texas, the mm-hmm. Rooster Teeth Convention. Mm-hmm. And that morning also at 10, we'll be doing a meet and greet that's thing right. with a table and a spot. And we won't get in trouble <laughs> for having a meet and I'm greet. I'm so excited to not get in trouble. I'm really excited, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm, I think we're going to do the live show. is going to be a game show. Yes. It's going to be. I'm coming up with all kinds of. Really, every email I send Rooster Teeth is, hey, do you think we have the capability to do this dumb thing I want to do? Can we get away with this? Yeah. Uh, There will be be audience interaction. So if you're going to the live show, you will be able to participate and possibly win some fun prizes. And by fun prizes, I mean stuff that I've used in kill count videos that I have no that need for anymore. We don't want anymore. The, uh, I think the best example of this is the model ear that yes. I bought for a quiet place. Yep. It's like a medical diagram of an ear. It was a cool prop. I don't need it. Please take it. Mm-hmm. I'll sign it. Yeah, so we'll that's s- what that's going to be. <laughs> yeah. I'm calling it the splices right, by the way. <gasps> nice. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Yep. So, yeah, uh, July 7th, you can buy tickets. Uh, we'll have links in the description. Yeah, just check that description for the link to get tickets. RTX, Austin, Texas, Sunday, July 7th. We're excited. Our first ever live show. God, I hope it goes well. Please show up. Please show up. Please come. Oh, I don't want to do I really it feel like room. I'm inviting all the kids in my class to my birthday party. Oh, you no. Know? Did, your, did you ever have a bad experience with that? No, I never really did birthday parties. Oh, you never do. You're so anti. I had. I mean, party. I did with my family, but like, mm-hmm. I didn't really have. No man, friends. you gotta fucking make it a celebration <laughs> but about I, you. I don't think you understand. Like, young me was not having <laughs> friends. Over. Like, I didn't have enough friends to warrant a birthday party. You wouldn't. You wouldn't have enough friends to have a, a overnight lock in at a laser tag place like I did for my no. like twelfth birthday. Oh, I'm so sorry, baby. It's okay. You know what? Everything that happened to you led you to here, so it's worth it. Mm-hmm. When your friends are books, then <laughs> oh, you grow God. up and you become a podcast host. <laughs> See, yeah, it works. <laughs> That'll force you to develop a personality real fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a shame that uh, books can't play laser tag. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, today we d- I did have some friends before. <laughs> People are like really upset. Yeah. <laughs> this is a comedy podcast. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh the we're looking at a movie that we heard so much about mm-hmm. before checking it out and we were like, "All right, what's up with you, man? What's up, The Perfection?" I get very very excited when someone tells me, "Chelsea, you need to watch this. Do not Google anything." I love it. Love that when that gets happens. me excited immediately. Mm-hmm. That's so my shit, like if it's something where knowing anything about the movie kind of ruins it, I, um, I'm i very excited. Speaking of which, uh, this Friday is the Sleepaway Camp kill count. And just as a last ditch effort, if you haven't seen that movie, please go watch it without knowing anything about it. Please. It's one of our favorites. I just want to pitch that. Just find it and watch it. Yeah, I think it is on YouTube. <laughs> well, you're podcast listeners, so I know that you guys are, you know, you'll do your homework. Mm-hmm. Go watch it. But today is The Perfection, which is uh, also really weird. Yeah. I'm also, I'm going to say right now, I don't even want to do the spoiler-free section review that we really? usually do. Because what am I going to say? You don't want to like walk it through and like uh, un- unveil the twists? No, we audience? will. But I'm saying I don't, I don't even want to say this is the part where we review it without spoilers. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Because what are we going to say? I mean, the only thing I can say is I really liked this and that's it. Yeah. Fair. And that it's graphic, I guess, if you're worried about that. It's graphic, yes. It does. It's I won't graphic. specify how. Mm-hmm. It just is. Yeah. And that's that. And that's what I'll leave you with. Because I know a lot of people like to listen to the podcast. You know, they won't watch the movie. They like listening to us explain it, which is fine. Mm-hmm. Maybe you are kind of wary of horror movies. I get that if, mm-hmm. if something freaks you out too much. But this, if you're thinking about watching it, 
go watch it and yeah. listen to this after. It's only 90 minutes. Yeah, that, it is a, a nice crisp 90 minutes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Yeah, I guess we'll out. get we'll get into it. The wow, uh, Lucy's freaking Lucy the just out. ran off to go watch it. It's like, oh, <laughs> oh shit, <laughs> mom and dad are going to spoil it. <laughs> yeah, I love that people told us to watch it. And then I just Googled the name, The Perfection. And like the three headlines I saw were like, let's talk about the craziness of The Perfection. The problematic perfection. Perfection's crazy twists. And I was like, great. I can't love wait it. to watch great. this. Yeah, problematic yeah. fave for sure, I guess. You think it's problematic? I I personally don't, I don't think it's that problematic. I mean, but and let let me okay. So let me sure. let me preface this with, and again, I'm, I'm about to ruin it. I'm about to ruin the whole thing. <laughs> yes, I I understand why some people take issue with this movie. Okay, my review of this is is I'm coming from a place of watching this and really loving it, being very entertained by it, and. I personally, me, I felt empowered by it. Okay. I recognize that's not the case for everyone watching this because we're all different and we experience film differently. Um, I especially understand why some people might take issue with the fact that this was a story directed by a man. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. I think it's a very empathetically made movie. So that's why I personally don't take issue with it. It was also co-written by a woman. So it's worth saying that too. We have And a I think a co-produced, co-produced by Stacey a woman, Rice, assuming Stacey co-written Rice by Nicole woman. Snyder, mm-hmm. who I believe did a lot of work on Supernatural. I, you know, it's got Allison Williams in it and I feel like she I mean, she was in Girls which I don't know. I didn't watch Girls. I was is that say, problematic? Girls I, I feel like is Okay, never mind. But I feel I like that she was in Get Out and then she's in this. I like that she uh I, I would love to see her continue on this I would too. taking on roles of like interesting horror movies. Me too. I'm I'm into it. I yeah. hope she cause then she can come be on the podcast. Oh yeah. yeah. Do it, Allison. <laughs> this movie's so funny because I wonder how they must have been so aware of by casting Allison Williams in a horror movie, <laughs> yeah. you're immediately sowing distrust, and they play on that so hard. They and I do. Think it's, it's perfectly I think it's great. Played. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. like perfect casting. But uh, yeah, so so uh, kind of going back to what I what I was saying, the reason if if you haven't seen it and you're still choosing to listen to this, yeah, the reason that um people maybe take umbrage with the fact that this was made by a man is this is a very uh, I've seen reviews calling it like hashtag me too kind of st- it's part of that moment I guess which yeah, I agree it, sure. it is especially because of it's and I noticed this a lot more the second time around it's clear connection and I think it's clear inspiration stemming from the gymnastics scandal the, oh, the Larry Nasser. yeah that fuck mm-hmm. that fucking fuck yeah so I think that there's a lot of that and so it also is oh yeah Oh geez. yeah, there's For I'm going to sure. get into that cuz I took I watched this two times and I took a lot of notes the second time. Cool. Uh and it also is technically a rape revenge movie. Yeah. But we were saying before we recorded how it's not a gratuitous or uh uh exploitative rape revenge movie. No, I think for me as a like both of us, we're we're big genre fans, we're big horror fans. I think we both agree that it is, it is technically a rape revenge movie, but it's not a capital R rape revenge movie. Like that genre, that specific horror genre of rape revenge, I don't think this fits. I'd be, if it is, it's also other things. Yes. You know, it's not just I spit on your grave. It, yeah, it is. So that's exactly that's what I think of is that even like Irreversible, which Irreversible is is closer to the kind of art house weird style that this is but irreversible still and what i think is the hallmark of a rape revenge movie is the movies i'm thinking of all have graphic rape scenes in them yeah and it's why i do not like them and i i don't enjoy them i you know yeah because even when they're good those are really difficult to watch yeah because like last house on the left they suck to watch yeah is a great movie by one last of our house favorites is a great Wes Craven. movie that is it has a lot to say it's a very smart film but wow is it difficult it is to watch. hard to watch and that this doesn't have any of that this is not that it's still it's it's tough but it we're not watching 
you're not watching any graphic rape scenes in this. And also the structure of this is not the rape revenge structure. Yeah. Cause not a rape at all. revenge movie is like maybe end of the first act. You have a fucking 15 minute long rape scene. You oh know? yeah. And standard rape. In a standard movies. rape yeah, revenge sure. movie. Yeah. That's like, like uh, the... what's the other one? Is that uh straw dogs is a, a straw dogs. For straw sure. dogs. Yeah. I think of two. Those all kind of follow a, a pattern, but this doesn't fit in that. It doesn't. You don't even know it's a rape revenge movie exactly. until the third act. Right. It's busy blowing your mind before that. Also, the only nudity in this movie is in like love scenes, not any of the rape mm-hmm. or sexual abuse scenes. It's uh, it's in, and you know, maybe it's exhibitive. It's a lesbian relationship. Yes. And maybe that's where some people also take umbrage yeah. is that it's a very, you know, sexy, sexy uh, lesbian relationship. I was, yeah, I was curious how people felt because that, like, and that's the area of the movie where I can't speak to whether or not that this, I can't be like, this is empowering because I, that's not like my place to, mm-hmm. to say, but uh, I was looking at, at reactions to this film on Twitter and I did see a lot of people saying that it was neat that, yeah, you have these two characters who they have sex and but it's not um you, one you don't have the obsessive lesbian trope. You think you do. You think you do. Which I think is fun. Yeah. That we subvert that. Cuz at first it's like, oh, it's one of those I was, it's the I was psycho like, oh, man, lady it's the crazy movie. lesbian movie, yeah. but it's not. You think it's going to be, but it's not. So it's cool that that gets subverted. Mm-hmm. And um these are two characters that really love each other. Yeah, that was the other thing is that uh, when the twists start happening, I was like, oh, was she even faking being a lesbian? But yeah. no, it is like a true love for each other. Yeah, and I think that that is really interesting and that's what made me really like this and like it even more watching it a second time because knowing their relationship and and what's really going on and watching it another time, I was struck by how differently the dialogue lands and how their chemistry feels knowing what happens to them in the end yeah because even before the twists start happening you're watching a horror movie mm-hmm. so you're never sure you're yeah like, you're yeah is this a yeah but it's it would be nice i didn't watch it a second time like you did but it would be nice watching it and knowing oh no they do actually like love each other yeah. this is sincere and so again, cool. if you if you if you watched this and you felt if you felt this was exploitive or you felt that this was weird representation, that's fine too. I'm not here. I'm not saying you're wrong. Or, I would love to hear uh, yeah, LGBT like, reactions to the relationship here because yeah. I don't think either of them are actually. I don't know. I don't Maybe know. they're bi or gay. I don't really know anything about. Uh, yeah, Allison Williams and Logan life. Browning. Logan Browning was in Dear White People, which which we also haven't seen yet. I would like to mm-hmm. to see that. Uh, so so should we just give a kind of a brief like here's the world of this movie? Sure, <laughs> we'll set that up. We we begin. We have Allison Williams is a she was a kind of child prodigy cello player, mm-hmm. a who, cellist, a cellist. <laughs> who went to this academy in Boston. I think she was basically scouted and she went to this academy to receive training, but then her mother got sick and she had to drop out to take care of her mom. And so her mom, present day, like just passes away. And yeah, Alice, 10 years later. She spent 10 years 10 away. 10 years, yes. Okay. Yeah. And Allison Williams then goes to find the people who run the school, Stephen Weber and I don't know who plays Paloma. Oh, Elena Huffman is Paloma. Yeah, and she calls them as like, hey, I, this line really stood out to me when she said, my mom finally died, or my mom finally passed away. Yeah. Like, that's such a weird way, but, you know, you're taking care of her for 10 years, putting your life on hold, it I guess. It probably feels like a, you know, it's she's not miserable anymore. Yeah, exactly. I wonder what the age they're supposed to be, because she's a teenager when she leaves, I think. I was think. wondering that, too. So maybe like uh, 15 to 25, 20, 16 to 26? That seems right. Allison Williams is probably playing a little younger than she is. I think she's I think 31, she is. She's, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I think they're they're kids in the mm-hmm. academy. That's important. Yes, they are children <laughs> mm, at this academy. Teenagers at the Early oldest. teenage, yeah. yeah. She finds the the school, they're, they're in China because they're scouting... Um, new students and they're holding a competition I think to I think we got is Shanghai straight up 
or is it Chinese or is that one of those weird? No, Shanghai is. Hong Kong is the. There's a couple Hong Kong, Taiwan, and but yeah, okay, Shanghai. Yeah, Sorry, I'm just <laughs> no, trying to cover I, all my I, bases. I, I, yeah, that's no, it's good to <laughs> <laughs> point that out. <laughs> no, I think yeah, because Shanghai's ma- it's it's straight up mainland China. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know if we're not. <laughs> we're trying here. Yeah. Um. So she she sees on this billboard another cellist who is Logan Browning and realizes that they've picked that they have this other prodigy that they have like and she recognizes her as uh, a girl she saw arriving at the academy the day that she was leaving right. too you get that in like flashbacks yeah. when they were younger so we as an audience are thinking oh this is the girl who took her spot mm-hmm. as the the beloved prodigy who's going to be you know groomed and made into this master cellist yeah because she gets to where they're having the uh final competition i guess to determine who will get into the academy and she you know finds anton played by steven weber Mm -hmm. uh (laughs) friend of yours chelsea (laughs) (laughs) i yeah we're casual acquaintances (laughs) i i worked on a show called murder in the first that he also was in um, that would have been it would have been a few years ago, but that was on TNT. And so when we were at Monster Palooza like last year, mm-hmm. I saw he was there. So I we caught up, and um, <laughs> I between uh that show and seeing him again, I had listened to his uh his audiobook of it, yeah, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. He it is it is like one of the because I've done a few audiobooks, but that one is so stand out to me. Like it really really moved me and. Um, he's a he's a really good dude. It was very weird watching him in this. Oh yeah, it was very very odd. Yeah, uh, at first he seems innocuous enough. Yeah, but a Anton. little weird. A little right? weird. So she goes there to where they're having this competition, and that uh, she's like, "Hey, Anton, hey, look," and he's like, "Oh yeah, I got your voicemail." And so when he's announcing that the judge of the competition is going to be this new prodigy, mm-hmm. Lizzie. Played by uh, that's Logan Browning. Logan Browning, that's right. Uh, he's also like, and since we have my old prodigy here, she'll help judge too. Mm-hmm. And so now they're they're judges together for yes. this competition. And that's instantly how. What is Allison Williams feeling? Yes, and what's what's fascinating too, and what I think is is interesting about the casting specifically of Allison Williams and Logan Browning in like the roles that they play because I guess you could you could flip them but what I think is interesting is we think right off the bat that our main character is Allison Williams who is the middle I think she said she's from like Minnesota she is yeah. she's very like girl next door um yeah she's playing like a very naivete to her it's, yeah it's a it's different than like her role in get out where she's much more yes. confident and yeah. strong she seems very plain Jane almost and then we meet who we are positioned to think is her rival, honestly, the way that this is all framed. And I think it's really interesting that the movie's setting you up to, like, make you think that they're going to hate each other or that they're competing against each other and that possibly Logan Browning is our villain. Sure. I think that that's how it's set up. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way we have it subverted, and I think maybe that's more of a core to this than I think people are giving it credit for is the idea of competition versus working together and not seeing each other as competition. Yeah. Especially when you are competing for the quote unquote perfection, this idea that only one person can be the most perfect. And I think around here is when we get some flashbacks, brief flashes of Alison Williams uh, having done a suicide yeah. attempt. Yeah, and, like she's screaming. We get some like flashes oh, of her Well, those screaming. are cool. Yeah, that's those like... freaked me out. Oh, those are yeah, right they're away. They're like jump cuts. And then there's the, the what is it? The split diopter? Oh, diopter? yeah, lots of split diopters in this, which if um, you've, you've seen it, I'm, like you would know it if you saw it. It's mm-hmm. a technique that if you watch any Brian De Palma movies, he's... I think Hitchcock does it sometimes. I think Maybe. so. I think De Palma is like, that's his. Okay. That's who I associate with them Citizen anyway. Citizen Kane has it too, right? Oh, does it? I think so. Because what it is, is when there's something very close in the foreground of a shot, in focus, and then like the other half of the frame has something in the background, also in focus. Oh, yeah. A movie that did it recently where I noticed it was Us. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Near the end of the movie, if you go see that, there is a very clearly, like, it is a De Palma shot, dude. It's the split diopter. And what it is, is you place half a, it's like half a piece of glass, basically, that goes into the lens. So you now have both of your, 
like different planes of uh, depth in focus. Yeah, because it might not, if you don't really know filmmaking or cameras, that might not seem unusual to you. But normally, when you, you only have a limited uh, space that's mm-hmm. in focus in a shot. So it can be either close or really far. Right. If you think of the camera lens as an eyeball, your eyeball can only focus on one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be able to focus on two objects at once. Yeah. Like I can't have my hand in focus when and I'm holding it up. Me. And also you right. sitting across exactly. from me. So that's what the split diopter does. Yeah. And now you'll notice them everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're very cool shots. They are. Yeah. They're very. And I think that was kind of a um, indication right off the bat that this was um, like the type of movies this was inspired by. We got you like De Palma and... I mean, it was so weird. Near the beginning, I I mentioned to you, I was like, why do I feel like this isn't supposed to be in English? And I couldn't <laughs> put my finger on why. And then I was reading an interview with the director, uh, Richard Shepard. And he was saying that he was really inspired by Park Chan-wook, which makes complete sense to me. He did Old Boy. Mm-hmm. And that, that trilogy of movies, that um, uh, Lady Vengeance and Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, this feels this is and I, I I some I can't take credit for this, but I think someone on Twitter said that this is like the most the closest we'll ever come, like Americans will come to making a South Korean thriller horror movie. And that's exactly what this feels like. Yeah, and Old Boy is also a story of like, you know, long stewed revenge. Yes. Just like this is. And things seeming Maybe not normal, but like it, it's weird. But then it just goes full blown crazy near the end of that movie. Yeah, twists that reframe everything that you saw. Yeah, exactly. But all, uh, uh, back to what I was going to say is that's another thing I could see as people finding problematic with this movie is that pretty much very early on you have indications that Allison Williams is not well mentally mm-hmm. uh, because, yeah, she had a suicide attempt. We mm-hmm. see her in a tub yes. uh, full of blood and then electroshock therapy. We see her getting her head shaved. And like, so I can see that people being like, is this just... Oh, reframing her. She's all, she's crazy. She's crazy. And and jealous. Like, and... Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And like, I just, I, I get that because we see that trope so many times and it's it can be lazy, mm-hmm. but I... I do think that this movie subverts it like it, it makes you think it's going to be that way but it's it's not yeah and I, I think that's another reason why oh like in the end I think that this is a very empathetic movie I don't know it's sorry I have complicated feelings about it you know because mm-hmm. it is ultimately a lot of this does feel very like the this is the story of two women and the way that women are kind of groomed and young girls are groomed. groomed. Is a good word for yeah. talking about this movie, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, this movie is all about grooming and specifically it's grooming with the like disguising grooming as we're training you to be your best. Yeah. If you like whiplash, you might like this movie. Ooh, nice. This feels nice I, I that'd be a disturbing double feature. Mm-hmm. Just in whiplash. But yeah, I think that once all the pieces fall into place by the end of the movie, you get why she would have attempted suicide and would have needed, uh, I don't know if needed electroshock therapy, but would have needed some kind of help. Yeah. Because it's not just a case of like, oh, I was a cellist and now I can't do it. It's like, it was brainwashing. It was like a cult thing. Mm -hmm. And like, that's going to fuck you up getting out of that and realizing you know, once you're removed from it. Yeah, and going back and watching this again, it was interesting seeing those flash cuts to that, to like having electroshock therapy and her suicide attempt because it happens right after she meets Anton and Paloma again and they say something about her mom. So the first time you're watching it, you're thinking, oh, did she, what, like did her mom getting sick and having to drop out of school? Is that what made her? Mm -hmm. But then you realize... No, it's because she's meeting these people again. And so you, you know, you, you're able to reframe it as like, oh, OK. Yeah. It's really neat because then every interaction between the two women and this are the two cellists is it's nice not having the the stress of wondering who has weird ulterior motives, yeah. who's going to betray the other one. And you re- like, you know, that that's not the case. And it. I loved all their dialogue so much more. Because, yeah, while they're watching the cellist performances that they're judging, uh, 
uh, Lizzie starts coming on to Charlotte mm-hmm. and is like flirting with her. And yeah, that first time through, you're like, oh shit, what's it? But no, it's like, oh, they're really into each other. Yeah, they're they're genuinely flirting with each other. What I also thought was interesting was that scene. They're very focused on a woman's hand in that scene, which I thought was like in retrospect. I also noticed too that they both were wearing like blue dresses and I made note of it. I, I was keeping a lot of track of colors and stuff the second time I went through because I love looking for that because it is amazing. We, you, you sometimes don't think about it, but like wardrobe people and costumers and stuff in something like this where it might not on its surface seem like there's much going on with costuming like everyone looks nice but it's you know we're not doing anything elaborate or crazy but there's still a story being told and how they're dressing these characters that I think is is for me at least it seemed pretty thought out and intentional in what way that there is like a color story that like evolves with colors they're choosing to put certain characters in and types of clothing like um for instance and this is going back to the the gymnastics scandal because mm-hmm. i think that this is very inspired by that paloma and anton especially they are always in either red blue white or black always okay paloma is in white or black sometimes but anton is always in red or blue the entire movie and i think it's interesting that those are the American flag colors they it's when you look at maybe who they're supposed to represent I don't think it's a coincidence that we're dressing them in red and blue Paloma has red white and blue stripes on at one point oh okay there's a scene where Lizzie comes back and this is before she knows that Charlotte was trying to save her Mm -hmm. Lizzie goes back and is begging like please let me do anything I'll scrub toilets I'll do anything like this is the only home I have the outfit they have her in, she looks like a gymnast. She has her hair up in a ponytail. I kind of remember that. She has um, Adidas sneakers on, and she has this like red, white, and blue windbreaker almost. She looks, it's so different than everything else she wears Wow! in the rest of the movie. And it's the scene where I She's think like it's- discarded. Yeah, I think it's like the crux of what this movie is trying to say. We're discarding- these women as soon as they're not useful to these people anymore especially Anton because she's begging Anton like you have power you can make it so that they accept me but that's not what he doesn't care about her he cares about her talents and so I think it's pretty pointed that that's also the scene where Paloma's wearing red white and blue stripes too it's like very color-coded okay I thought so yeah there's a lot of that going on in this which I, I thought yeah this I think it's a it's a smart movie I think the reviews of it calling it trashy are not like it's not trashy it's it's campy it is pretty campy it's very campy it is over the top Mm -hmm. i don't think it's supposed to be realistic Mm -mm. i don't think it's trash though i don't think it's trash at all Mm -mm. it's also got really great cello music yeah. Like in that scene when they're watching that performance, uh, I was actually kind of sad when they started flirting with each other. I, I was like, like no, no, I want to hear wanna, more. Yeah. I want to watch them play cello. Yeah, it's really good cello music. Right, 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 right. So yeah, they strike up a relationship and they end up going out clubbing and having their uh, their sexy good times at the uh, yeah. hotel together. Uh, during the scene where they, they play together and Charlotte's like, I can't, I can't. And then... Oh, they do have a little uh, impromptu performance Yes, together. and that's yeah. happening... It's intercut with the club in and the, so that's why I bring this up. That's right, yes. Um, Lizzie tells Charlotte, and this is what ultimately convinces Charlotte to to play, and this on a rewatch was like a really nice line. It's, she says, you have been and always will be the person who makes my heart skip a beat when you play. Mm-hmm. And it was really, really nice rewatching this movie and knowing there's no, there's nothing sinister about that yeah it's and- genuine admiration for another person and ultimately when they like they fall in love and it's sweet yeah because when they meet like charlotte appears to be kind of nervous and lizzie's like no don't be nervous i remember you because in that scene when they're kids and they're passing each other one arriving one leaving Char- uh lizzie does smile at her like mm-hmm. I, was, I was like oh cool she's a, a nice girl and so yeah they they know each other they remember each other and they strike it uh yeah, they admire each other. For sure. And I also love that there's just two lines that I noticed, maybe there are more, that are well written for Charlotte 
having put her life on hold for 10 years Mm -hmm. because when she meets Lizzie, she's like, I downloaded all of your music and like people don't download music anymore. Yeah. They stream it. Yeah. You know, but but maybe 10 years ago, you'd be downloading music. And the other line I noticed was when they're uh, in the hotel or talking about getting a hotel, she's like, we could order some pay-per-view. Yeah. It's like, that's not really a thing that people do anymore. So, yeah, I don't know. I like those lines. It does really make you like subconsciously, she's like not cool. Yeah. She <laughs> definitely seems not cool. Yeah. Which I love. That scene also, they, they leave, they run out together and they're holding hands and it's the hands that they both lose at the end. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So Lizzie it has been planning a vacation, a yeah. short vacation. Yeah. Lizzie's like, I'm taking a break. I want to go, go on a trip, go on a vacation. She says, I want to rest my hands. <laughs> and Charlotte says, all right, let's, yeah, we'll, we'll go on a trip together. It'll it's going to be like a rustic trip. They're going to take like a bus through the, uh, is it like the Chinese? Uh, yeah, it's just like through China. Through China. Yeah, which, uh, that's a huge ass country. Yeah. With, I'm sure a lot of wilderness and like. That's scary. <laughs> like that in Russia would be the scariest to just Especially drive around. Especially you in. don't speak the language, which they don't. They have a hard time communicating and this, with other this people. This seems fun to watch again because, and this is, uh, man, this this is an issue I have with like movie criticism sometimes where people are like this movie's not realistic like I, she had to she chops off her hand to convince her to oh leave. we're just talking about that now well yeah sure yeah but yeah like oh she hit she make does this whole elaborate plan and gets her to mutilate herself and like she has to go to that extent to get her to leave and it's like it's a movie. Yeah. Does Jigsaw have to go to the extent he does <laughs> like, to make no. people appreciate their lives? It's no, like, it's part of the movie. This is a heightened reality that's like very metaphorical. And if we're, if we're again, that, that scene we were just talking about, which I feel like is such a core of this movie where Lizzie is turned away because she doesn't have a hand anymore. And we realize how much that these two don't care about her and that they just i think it's purposeful that it's such a um extreme yeah like it's it's heightened to really communicate that idea of uselessness you know yeah they don't love you they love your hand Mm -hmm. the the extremity to which this movie goes to i think does such a service to what it's trying to say and i don't think this movie's nearly as interesting if what she taught she's talks to her and asks yeah, it's a nicely fucking movie we have to see it's a something movie. yeah and also you're brainwashed yeah. into this cult talking's well, not gonna work that's why when they're having drinks this is before they decide to go on this trip together charlotte you can tell she's testing her she's she is yeah. she's saying do you ever think about leaving and lizzie's like no this is my family um this is this is special work and charlotte it's looks kind of ex- sad it's what's expected of us and that line when she says it's what's expected of us that's when you can start to see charlotte like again this is why i think watching it again is interesting because mm-hmm. you can start to see her put pieces together like i need to do something and that's before the whole thing happens when mm-hmm. she like turns out she drugs her yeah and then when she talks about going on this trip you also start to see charlotte you can tell she's thinking like okay this is when i could do this and make this happen you could she's planning it it doesn't just kind of happen mm-hmm. and again it, it's a heightened reality to communicate this idea of abuse disguised as love and valuing someone for what they they do for you versus actually caring about them yeah and the reason she knows that uh lizzie's really in deep with the academy is because she notices a musical note tattoo that's that right, she has tattoo. that they both have now mm-hmm. and uh yeah that's for the upper echelon of this academy right and again, like the tattoo is super heightened too. Like that's the imagery is like not like that's not realistic. I mean, who knows? Are you but... seeing people complain about this? Yes. Kind of shit? I was reading reviews of this and just general reactions of people saying like it's it's not realistic that she would just go right to this extreme of drugging someone and making them mutilate themselves to leave. Like what? She can't just I don't know. It's a movie, you guys. It's a movie. <laughs> Watch like watch other movies, you know. <laughs> I think sometimes people have a very narrow idea of what a good movie is and what makes a good movie, and that idea is sometimes like this must make realistic sense in the universe I live in. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's the difference between realistic and verisimilitude. We close our minds off and 
we nitpick things and don't let ourselves enjoy stuff. Yeah, I can't stand nitpicky. And criticism. again, I'm that, I'm saying that's different than if you if you didn't enjoy this and you have reasons like that. That's, oh yeah, that's different than like um this would never happen. Like yeah, no shit, it would never happen. Yeah. So they go on this trip on this bus to the Chinese countryside. They can't mm-hmm. speak the language. There's one guy on the bus who kind of speaks English. Yeah. But yeah, Lizzie starts getting real sick, yeah. throwing up bile. Bile. And then uh, at one point she throws up and Charlotte's like, are those fucking bugs in your puke? And Holy there are like all shit. these There's bugs in the puke. There's maggots and stuff. And mm-hmm. then she, yeah, uh, they stop the bus so she gets off and takes a shit. Yeah, she has to shit on the side of the road. And basically she's causing such a scene and freaking people out so hard. Just like banging your head on the window and stuff oh, yeah. and Jesus. I'm like why isn't because watching it again I'm like well fuck why isn't Charlotte doing something when she's banging her head on the That's window right. but I'm realizing <laughs> she's making it so that they kick them off the bus mm-hmm. because right. she can't leave any reason because yeah she's I lit I think I wrote down why is she being like Willy Wonka she's like she has to she has to let Lizzie do everything herself. Because yeah, or while let, Lizzie let is, let it is hurting herself, Charlotte's like, "No, stop! I know, please." Stop. Yeah, it's a very Willy yeah. Wonka move, and I'm like, "Why don't you just go stop her physically?" It makes sense in retrospect. They need to get that bus. They need to get kicked off the bus, and they do. Yeah, they get kicked the hell off that bus because they, those other uh, people don't want to get sick. Yep, fair. <laughs> fair, sure. <laughs> Although they do kick them off in the middle of the mountains. Well, they say, well... well There's like a town. Thank, town. thank God that guy was there. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Yeah, but they say, okay, we'll get you help when we get to this town. They pull away. Yeah, they're in the middle of fucking nowhere and Lizzie's, Lizzie is seeing bugs and her skin and, starts Oh yeah, she's like, my brain's on fire. Yeah, she's like, my brain's on fire. Pause, I will say that this is the one part of the movie where it goes on so long that I started to feel like, all right, I've heard her say the same lines over and over and over again. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you want to use a metaphor in line with the movie, they're playing the same note over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. and, And right as I started to get pretty annoyed, it finally escalated and changed. But it does go on a little bit, for me at least, of her being like, you have to help me, you have to help me. My brain's on fire. I'm really sick. This isn't normal. Like those lines Mm -hmm. were said over and over again. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, eventually, they're kicked off the bus and things escalate. Yeah. Because, yeah, her arm uh, starts bubbling and uh, does she like tear away and find bugs or she's just no, like, no, there are bugs She's looking and me. there's her skin's bubbling up and all of a sudden these bugs just fucking pop out mm-hmm. her and they're crawling oh, yeah. all over and it's gross and yeah, it's CGI. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. And then it's a very abrupt moment when Charlotte is like, you know what you have to do and she has a cleaver out of nowhere <laughs> And she gives it to Lizzie. And Lizzie takes it and, and fucking hacks her own hand off. off. Her arm. And then the screen goes black and then it rewinds itself. Yeah, it's oh. like the cheesy classic oh, rewind. It. It's with great. <laughs> yeah, so that's when we realize, oh, fuck. This is what was going on. Yep, it goes back to that morning and it shows that Charlotte has been drugging Lizzie with psychoactive medicine that her mother... That her mom was taking. Ties in with that and it says halluc- like hallucinations. Like especially- retching, diarrhea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And hallucinations with alcohol, which yep. she had also been giving her. Yep. And uh, then I really like this when we're going back through... And it's showing how all the hallucinations were just the power of suggestion, Mm -hmm. which is like a real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you you lay things and then suggest it because we see. And I also thought this was funny. The first time through, she throws up on the window and you see that it's just yellow bile. But then there's a shot of Charlotte being like, are are those fucking bugs? And it cuts back and there are bugs. And I was like, there weren't bugs a minute Mm -hmm. ago. That's because there weren't bugs at all. Yeah, uh, it's the power of suggestion after it, Charlotte it is, says that. It is funny, too, because that first time through, I was like, is Allison Williams acting weird here? Like, it seemed bad, mm-hmm. but it's because she is <laughs> being acting. like, there's bugs and it's, you know, it's also a uh, good benefit for Allison Williams plan that like nobody else on that bus speaks English. Yeah, she could exactly. be like, there are bugs there's and no bugs, one's going to be like, bugs. no, there's not. Yeah, except that one guy. But I don't think he's that invested. Yeah. He's just <laughs> kind of freaked out. 
And at this point, we both just wrote, do not trust Allison Williams. Yep. It's like this, Allison Williams. This is why I think <laughs> casting her is so genius. It's so good because we're like, oh, they got us again. Especially opposite a black, a black cast person, member. Yes. I think it was like really <laughs> That, <laughs> kind of great. Like, I don't know if it was done entirely intentionally, no. but I'm sure at one point they were like, this is funny. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, I think it's it's perfect. It's so over the top. I know, man. She cuts her fucking arm off. It's, yeah. And then we're like, wow, Elson Williams did that because she was jealous. She was, yeah, and we're just like, she's a jealous bitch. Yeah, <laughs> and, that, and at this point, I am thinking... Oh man. This is when I was I think we both said, Oh man, is it gonna be this kind of movie? Like it's crazy, crazy jealous. Psycho bitch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But wait, there's more there's to come. More. Which is nice. So <laughs> this is when this is the scene I was talking about where we I think it's like three weeks later, mm -hmm. Lizzie shows up at the conservatory. I, they couldn't get a hold of her. She's just been missing for three weeks. I can't like there's nothing I could have done because I took the pills. I did like I, I chopped off my own. I did everything. Yeah, there's no legal ramifications. Right. I guess. And that's why I think going back and watching it. Yeah. Charlotte is just kind of like hands off letting her go nuts on this bus because she really didn't do anything. It Although, also probably helps that it happened in China. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> so that's when she's she's begging for them to take her back. And that's when she is purposely, I think costume as this like she looks like a gymnast yeah because they take her back for a night i think they're like okay and but then the next morning or i it's hard to tell how much they're, time has yeah passed. they're like you need to leave I yeah because paloma especially is like this is a conservatory yeah, not a convalescent home yeah yeah wow yeah it's brutal mm -hmm. they're like why would charlotte do this and lizzie says because she's a jealous fucking bitch and i was like oh no i know that's <laughs> yeah and that's like i was worried that's what we were gonna that's the movie we're doing Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of movie where I would be really annoyed that a man directed it. I'm like, of course a man directed this, <laughs> making these two women like fight. And yeah, it's happened a lot. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I do like that. There's a when they're getting uh, when they're kicking Lizzie out in her plea to stay with them. And she says, music is my life. Music, <laughs> like, yeah, she goes, music, music is, is my, my life. life. <laughs> and then we're just sitting there laughing at this not funny moment. <laughs> we're like, what? what? What do you mean you're kicking me out of the conservatory? I know. And then we were saying she could get a little clothes <laughs> oh, hanger yeah, little to put on her hanger. stump. I, I can still play with a co hanger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then Lizzie is understandably upset that she has been turned away by Anton and Paloma, and she goes to Minnesota. Allison Williams' house, and she gets in there, and she tases the fuck out of yeah. Charlotte and kicks the crap out of her. And this is when I started noticing another wardrobing choice that I okay. thought was really interesting was when Lizzie first shows up at the Academy when she's by herself, because I think that's the first time in the movie we've seen her by herself. Oh. Every other scene, she is like with Allison Williams or not alone. She's in the Academy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But the, we get to see her for the first time alone and she's wearing this gray, I think it's a, ho a hoodie. I forget. It's, it's like, like a gray sweats. sweater. Yeah. Then when she goes and finds Allison Williams, Allison Williams is alone and she's like chopping tomatoes. She's also in a, a gray sweater and she was in the beginning as well when she's sitting by herself. Every time we see one of these two girl characters alone, like the main characters alone, they're wearing gray and they're wearing these gray, either a sweater or hoodie. And I, I was like, okay, maybe I'll keep an eye out for that. I don't know if that's just a coincidence or not. But then later we do, when we get the flashback to Charlotte as a kid, and she's playing for, for Stephen Webb, for Anton, she has a gray hoodie on over her. Oh. Yeah, which I thought, yeah. So I'll get more into what I think that that ends up kind of becoming. Okay. Because it's a thing, especially in the ending scene. I didn't notice that, yeah. I didn't notice it the first time, but the second time I kept an eye out. So then after she tases and kicks the crap out of Charlotte and she puts her boot over her boot over mm -hmm. her mouth, it cuts to Anton doing his little conducting in his That's car. That's when he's in the car, yeah. yeah. And he pulls up to the academy and oh, yeah, Lizzie's there yeah. with Charlotte in the trunk. And that's when, so that's the other scene where he's listening to classical music by himself in the car. I think this, in retrospect, is a hint to what's really going on in this movie because we have... Anton, who is, he's in the car with Paloma, but it's just like in his private life, he's he's listening oh, to classical he is, music. Yeah, yeah. 
But on the bus in China, we have Charlotte who has headphones on and she's listening to rap, I think. Yeah. She's not listening it's to classical. It's not classical music. Yeah. It's popular music. So I think that that's unquote. kind of like a hint. Like Anton is fully ingrained and she's in like this broken world. out. And of she's, it. yeah. Mm, yeah. Like nice. behind her facade, like she's, would the obsessive cellist also be listening to classical music you know because it's she... a very yeah a uh, purposeful choice yes her music on the the mm-hmm. bus and i noticed it but i didn't think exactly but more in retrospect it. it's it's interesting to realize yeah if she is what we think she is on the surface she wouldn't be listening to that yeah she'd be listening to stuff like steven weber is listening to in the car nice yeah so yeah lizzie's like you kicked me out because i didn't have anything you wanted now I do. Can I come home? Because here's Charlotte in the trunk of my says, car. I have the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and so he has a little sit down chat with Charlotte and is like, what is going on? And uh, she says that once she saw that tattoo, she knew that she had to break Lizzie out of the brainwashing mm-hmm. that they had undergone and that she was trying to save Lizzie from him. And it's a great moment because his reaction at first is like stammering and like trying to like laugh it off. Like, what What do you mean? And then his face gets serious and it's like, oh, no, she's right. Mm-hmm. And he knows that she's right. Yeah. And it's when like the facade breaks and you realize, yes, he really is the villain. Because when do we get these flashbacks? Is it right around here? Oh, it is right here. When we see what she went through because we see young Charlotte performing in that acoustically perfect room Mm -hmm. and she makes a little mistake one that I I noticed a little bit but also her face like belies it and is like oh I made I messed up and then Steven Weber uh comes up and it's it's a long scene it's so good though it's a very good long scene and the first time I'm watching it I even wrote maybe saw spoiled me but this flashback is taking forever to reveal this twist. But it's not a Saw style flashback yeah. where it's supposed to be like, ah, quick twist, and this is like why everything you knew was wrong. No, this is a flashback that's showing the severity of what she went through and what Lizzie went through. It's such a good scene in demonstrating that we're we're grooming you to be perfect and that's our they they say a lot of uh getting being closer to god and yes achieving godliness and because even you were like are we headed towards a cabin in the woods type ending here like is it a higher purpose thing and i like that it's not mm-hmm. that it is uh it's like what's that documentary we watched about the guy who kidnapped his neighbor and the aliens oh 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 um the like plane the high Hiding in plain sight or something. Something in plain yeah. sight. It's like that. It's like these cult, like sex cults uh-huh. that you hear about and learn about. And those often are tied to uh, saying that there's a higher purpose because the impressionable young victims are more likely to go along with it and believe it if they think. Because like, think of how scared you were of the afterlife and being judged by God and higher powers when you're younger. Like you want to do anything to avoid the wrath of god and if it's this guy at a music conservatory saying i have to rape you for a higher purpose yeah and especially since he also frames it as this is tradition this is how i was taught this is how it's always been yeah i went through it so you have to there's that kind of there's that like hazing yeah because it's uh when she makes the mistake yeah he like it's him and he, he has these two dudes, Theus and Jeffrey. Theus and Jeffrey. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, the it's implied like they rape her when she messes up a note. And, and it's like, implied it's, that that happened to them. It, yeah. He says it happened to them. Right. Yeah. So I think including that like history and yeah, implying that this is like just what the school's always been and him explaining that to her is kind of how abusers and people in positions of power deflect like this is this is how it's always been done this is the institution we have to do this because it's what's expected and they, yeah. that's what they always say is it's what's it's what's expected of you yeah. to achieve the perfection yes yeah, so that's how anton is deflecting and you know he's he's not some random pervert that's what he says yeah he really frames it in that way of like i'm not an evil man i'm not a monster right I'm a taskmaster he says right like this is no i'm yeah i'm doing this for this this purpose this is part of something bigger and, and maybe he believes it yeah he might believe he it he might believe it you know he might believe yes this is the way to get a perfect musician which will be a gift unto the world 
doesn't make any any less evil. Yeah. This fucking guy. Yeah. Oh exactly. boy. So he punches her out. It's like a first person punch. Oh, in present to, day. Yes, in present day. Uh, he punches her out and it cuts to a red screen and then she's tied up in that acoustic room and he says that she has to play for him and that if she messes up, it'll be Zhang Li. And she's begging like, it, if it has to be done, do it to me. Yeah, don't and, do it to Zhang Li. And it's, this, and it's lines like that that I'm still like, is it a Cabin in the Woods type ending where there is a higher thing? Because she says, if it has to be done do it to me like is there an actual supernatural consequence right. if this process isn't done and so I, I find it interesting that the movie is even able to start to convince the audience that maybe there is something to what they're Some saying bigger purpose like is there a reason they're doing this yeah but no it's just an evil fucking like mm-hmm. sick dude yeah like you're yeah it, that is interesting like you're you're also kind of put in the position to second guess like yeah. does this have to happen what is yeah yeah that's interesting mm-hmm. i i wrote here that jang lee is very purposely in a she, i mean she's dressed like a cupcake she's like in a <laughs> light pink she's in a light pink dress it's very fluffy and girly and it's like it's look very, at yeah. this little girl yes it's very childlike and then we have allison williams is in red which is like the matured version of pink <laughs> it's you know it's a dark pink yeah <laughs> uh and again it, she's she's put in red by the characters who are always wearing those red, white, and blue, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of coding it as like American. And Lizzie is here too, and she's dressed in a in new a, outfit. She's also wearing a navy blue suit, and it's a suit. It's a suit, yeah. Yeah, she. Uh, it just it feels very different than everything she had worn prior to this. Mm-hmm. I don't know if uh, I guess it's it's kind of like a corporate outfit, as though she is part she's, of this uh, mm-hmm. the the establishment. Mm-hmm. holding down Allison Williams and she is saying outwardly I agree with them like the the ability to play perfectly or close to perfection was a gift to me and you took it away by chopping off my hand and no I don't care what they did to me to get me to that point it was worth it so she appears to still be brainwashed and sided with uh Stephen Weber and the Academy mm-hmm. and so Allison Williams begins to play and it's really nice cello music but then and this mess up I didn't notice musically oh I love how they did this. but they they let you know that she messed up because like the screen glitches the camera jerks it li- yeah. it looks like someone bumped into the camera it does because it's a close-up on Stephen Weber as yeah. he's watching her perform and yeah like the camera jerks and his face uh shows like oh she messed up and so yeah she messed up mm-hmm. and he does he he sends Zhang Li away yeah and that's when he says what you thought I was gonna I was gonna rape Zhang Li I'm not some random pervert I'm not a random pervert there's a system here yeah I'll rape her later and that's part of the the gaslighting right is like how dare you thought that you thought oh my gosh how that, dare you think such a terrible thing like we're not we're not we're not like evil. That. What yeah. the hell? You, like, and like, shame on you for pervert. thinking that. Yeah. Such gaslighting. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm not as bad as you thought. Exactly. Oh, man. But mm-hmm. then he brings in Theus and Jeffrey yeah. again. And he's and like. And he says, call me back in when she's done biting. Yeah. Yeah. Fucker. So he will happily have her in a weakened state yes, and let the others leaves. wear her down. Yeah. And, but Lizzie says she wants to start first. And we get. A suggestion of a very... uh... This is when this movie... Okay, for all it implies that, like, yeah, there's there's rape and sexual violence. And I'm thinking, oh, man, are they actually going to do this? Because they have Allison Williams tied up. They basically have her spread eagle. And Lizzie's like, no, I want I want to go first. And she unwraps her stump. Yeah. And she is going to rape her with that stump. And oh, guys, man. I think that's when I was like... I think I love this movie because, like, that's so fucking weird. That's so fucked up. That's so fucked up. Uh, but luckily, right before anything can happen, I, I think you're able to say that you like that because it doesn't happen. Yes, because yeah. it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. But just because we think it's gonna happen now, in retrospect, I'm like, man, I fucking love it. <laughs> that we think maybe, oh man, someone like she's gonna rape her with a stump hand. Oh, man. But then, <laughs> luckily, before anything can happen, not that anything was going to happen, uh, Theus and Jeffrey choke and just, like, keel over. Yep, because Lizzie had poisoned their drinks. Yep, we we know. I think at this point, I figured 
maybe this was the case that they were in on it together. Yeah, because it's another. Yeah, they re- rewind. Another and- rewind, and we see that. So when uh, when Lizzie first went back to the academy, that was all true. Like, she was very upset and yeah. angry. Yes. And she did want to go back to the academy and be back with them. And it was after they kicked her out and she went to Charlotte's house that her her flip happened. Because we see that after she had her boot on Charlotte's mouth, after tasing her and kicking her, she removes the boot and they have a conversation. Yeah, and she I, I think that's when she realizes... Like, she's pissed at her, understandably. Understandably. Chop, made her chop her hand off. Couldn't she have gotten her to chop off her left hand instead so she could still, like, write and use stuff? Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Fair. Um, unrealistic. Unrealistic. <laughs> no, and that's when we realize she she comes to terms with the fact that Anton and Paloma didn't love her. And that's when Charlotte says, look, I I had to do this. And we, we find out that she, right after... She chopped her hand off when they're on the side of the road. That's when Charlotte is like, I had to do this to you. You were in so deep and blah, blah, blah. I had to make sure they had no reason to ever want to see you again. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you have both of your hands, that's how in deep you are. Is they're still going to find a way to bring you back and to keep you there and abuse you. And so after that came to fruition, she lost her hand and got kicked out because she was useless to them. Now that was when Lizzie was like, all right, Charlotte's right. Yeah. Let's plan to get back at these fuckers. And that's when they have a really nice scene where they sit there and when, no, yeah. So it's, it's during that flashback when I, I really like Charlotte's, lines about saying you know when when you go back and they they have no reason to want you anymore because they don't love you and they kick you out I will be there for you yeah and she tells her like I will be there and that's the affirmation that their love is real yeah and that even though she did manipulate Lizzie to get to that point it was out of an actual sincere right and again in real life it's fucked up, yeah, right? Of course. <laughs> but this is a movie and we are in this weird little heightened universe to where I think it is very beautiful because it's, a, you know, this is not real. Yeah, it's one of my life. favorite parts of Alison Williams' performances. Yeah, there same. On the side of the road and, when she's saying that. Yeah, and saying like, I will, like, I'll do anything to help you. And I think it's really, really nice. Also, uh, a note with her performance is that first rewind when we're seeing her like drug lizzie and uh see a cleaver at a shop that they're at Mm -hmm. that she'll steal so that she can cut off her hand like the first time you see it you might even trick yourself into thinking that she's like smiling sadistically but she's not is she it's more of like a matter of fact of like i'm gonna do this this is what i have to do it's it's not her like her get out character where she would be taking some kind of glee in it Mm -hmm. so so then they they decide to put this whole plan together and this is where it finally culminates and they go to fuck up Steven Weber. They go to just fuck Anton's shit up and this is where my little note about the gray hoodies and gray sweaters and how they're both wearing them when they're in these scenes alone. Mm -hmm. This is where I think it's done very purposely because what are they both wearing when they walk in to fuck up Anton? They both have gray hoodies on. Oh yeah? Yeah. They are in like matching little gray hoodies when they walk in and they stop his uh record player and they put on their own music to just oh, yeah. get ready to just fuck him up. It's so good. And it's very heightened and very cheesy. And I love it because they're saying like, we're going to chop your balls off and sell them as trinkets. They didn't. I thought they were. <laughs> I thought they were <laughs> I too. really thought they were. Oh, yeah. But just in case there's any lingering confusion, that means that everything, uh, when we see Anton pull up and... Lizzie's there with Charlotte in the trunk. At that point, they're they're both together. in on it. Yeah. So bringing Charlotte back was part of the plan to get back at them. Right. Uh. So yes, they kill Paloma. Yes. Paloma they... pees herself. Yeah. Because she's gotten stabbed in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is one when, when they both confront him. He immediately starts. It's this self pitying. He says, "I I'm sick. I can get help. I can get treatment. You know." Oh, I didn't. I, I missed that. Yeah. When they're saying like they're basically just 
telling him straight up like you you raped us you disguised it as love blah 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 and that's when he goes into this self-pitying act that we see so many you know in real life we see this often like in that kind of Larry Nasser type case where you have people abusers on trial so often their defense is I'm I'm not well I can get help and he retreats immediately into that but they don't buy it and they kick his ass yeah but during the fight he does stab into charlotte's hand and then slits down her her left hand yeah oh it's oh god it is graphic he slits that forearm right in half netflix netflix original movies and their hand trauma i can't like this and gerald's game are like oh oh. (laughs) gerald's game made me feel lightheaded and i don't think I can't think of another movie where I felt dizzy during it. <laughs> yeah, but that movie made me feel sick. It's really good. Uh, yeah. So her her arms all fucked up, but they ultimately they both stab him to death. Not it's, to death. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because oh, yeah. they like put a cleaver in his neck. Yeah, I thought I, he was done. I'm thinking, done okay, for. he's he's dead. We're done. That's Turns right. I out, forgot. Yeah, an Duh. undisclosed period of time later. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see him in a real Johnny got your gun. Got Johnny it got is, his gun situation. Yes. He's missing Johnny all of his for limbs. Sure. His eyes are gone. I'm assuming his tongue is gone. They so I his ears. His ears have to be there because he has to hear them play. Right. Yeah, but he's just a stump. So hooked up to an IV, keeping him alive and in I'm a chair. And I'm thinking, I actually rewound the movie and went and looked for it. I was like, is the IV her mom's? I couldn't find it, but I was wondering how did they keep him oh, maybe, down maybe. there? But I'm assuming that they they probably both went to the hospital and got <laughs> treated because they have like hospital bandaging on. Yeah, and Charlotte's left arm is amputated, the one that got mm-hmm. slid open. So. But he is like sewn together. He looks like a rag doll. Like it's not, this yeah. is not... I don't think doctors did that. I think they they did it themselves. And I think maybe she brought over some medical equipment that, you know, from because we have the backstory of her having a sick mom. Yeah, that makes sense. And And again, not realistic. Duh, no shit. (laughs) But then they sit down together and play the cello for him. uh, Charlotte's right hand and Lizzie's left hand. Yeah. Because and they're a two headed cello player. It's like an improv game. They achieve the perfection. Mm -hmm. And uh, I. This is an aspect of the the ending is uh, what a lot of people took issue with is they kind of interpreted it as and same with that one line in Game of Thrones where Sansa says something like, oh, I wouldn't be who I was if I didn't suffer all this abuse. Mm -hmm. And some people interpreted this ending scene as, oh, the they are able to achieve the perfection because of the scars that their abuse has left. And I I just didn't I don't know, like, that's not what I came away with. Yeah. with I, I i feel like it's more uh uh they were able to achieve perfection together instead of competing with that's each how other. i that's how i took it too is the idea of of trying to find one perfect person and, and hoisting that person above all others is not possible because that's not a thing you don't have one perfect person who's the best that's not you know when we achieve perfection by by completing each other and by enhancing each other's strengths that's at least what I got from that and to tie into that that theory they going back to like them having gray shirts on this whole movie and they have the gray hoodies on what are they both wearing in this last scene we've got one of them and is in a black jumpsuit one of them's in a white jumpsuit Mm. And so when you mix white and black together, you get gray. Aww. And so they, they complete each other. I nice. like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think that ending scene was really, really beautiful. I, I didn't take away that it was like, oh, they, they achieved the perfection because of their abuse and that they, yeah, that's... they're stronger because they got abused. No, like, that no, was like I... his point of view. Exactly. That was what he believes. But I, I just thought, no, they achieved perfection because they subverted our expectations and they weren't each other's competition but they helped each other and yeah 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 we both like this movie yeah. we've given our interpretations i'd love to hear other people's uh we had really good audience engagement last week with the personality types oh, a yeah. lot of comments were very i i was very happy reading all those comments so thank you i would love uh for the podcast to continue getting those 
fun discussion comments. Yeah. Of people with their own thoughts and ideas. For yeah. Me to read. Like, please have like a, a conversation about this. I think it's a movie that warrants a lot of conversation. If you love it, if you hated it, if you, you know, I, I, I want to just kind of open it up to having a productive conversation about it instead of having nitpicky bullshit conversations about it. Yeah. And even if I can't, find the time to respond know that i'm probably reading them especially with podcasts they get a uh less comments in a good way than kill counts because they don't just get a whole bunch of like kill count spam. requests yeah uh right. and so i i pretty much read all of the podcast comments especially usually, the yeah. first day mm-hmm. I i'll read, read them all too. of them so please leave them i'm reading them yeah yeah uh anything else um i don't think so if you if you liked the perfection and you want to watch more stuff like it definitely check out like south korean thrillers sure yeah like, so old that's boy, what like it's not feel. horror uh maybe adjacent yeah, but it's, uh, it definitely evokes feelings of horror <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah horror sure. adjacent i mean even this that first half is you'd be hard pressed to call the horror movie but a lot of I, I feel like a surprising amount of horror movies especially yeah de palma mm-hmm. horror movies it's like, is this a horror? Yeah. And they're the type of horror that I didn't watch as a kid because mm. my idea was, no, horror is either slashers or ghost movies, like mm. things that are scary or trying to be scary the whole th- way throughout. But yeah, if you if you brought in your interpretation of the genre a little bit, mm-hmm. you get to include cool shit like this. Yeah. So yeah, check that out. Um, we're going to be off next week because I'm going to be visiting my family. Oh, that's next week that we're off? Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Oh, are we going to do the uh, upload like put up old- a rerun? I think I'll do that on YouTube. Um, I'm going to put like an audio version of one of the older podcasts where we didn't have a video. Because I think it was the first five episodes aren't yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, so we'll put one of those up so that if you have only been watching it on YouTube, you, will, you, you can listen to an older one. Yeah, there won't be video. For audio only, this is already in the podcast feed, so I don't yeah. see the point in putting a rerun. Exactly. There, but but there will be something for the YouTube people to check out if uh, you need your Tuesday fix and you haven't checked out those early episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then after that, we'll have maybe the cursed ones. I think after that, we're going to do, yeah, horror movies that are cursed, quote unquote. <laughs> and then, yeah, we'll uh, fill up the other weeks before we get to July, which is our paranormal pool party. Paranormal pool party. We're going to do all the paranormal activity movies. The the four in the series. Yes, yeah, not the spinoff. Things. And uh, we'll probably have some guests for those. Mm-hmm. And we're our, our summer finest. So mm-hmm. I'm excited for that. Don't forget about our first live show, RTX, July 7th, Sunday. Link in the description for any uh, for your tickets. Hope to see you there. Yeah, please come. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you can check out Dead Meat on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Carebeck, C-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, deadmeatstore.com. Mm-hmm. Feel free to email deadmeatpod at gmail.com with any feedback or suggestions. But until two weeks from now, because mm-hmm. we're off next week, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. Mm-hmm.